Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectors, and welcome to episode 85 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and in this episode, I interview Annette Sprata, who is a, and my apologies, Annette, for mangling your name. My apologies to any German-speaking individual who understands that I mangled Annette's name. Now, uh, she did say it was acceptable for uh, folks from North America who regularly pronounce her name Sprat, uh, but Annette is a author who has written romance, contemporary fiction, children's fiction, is both traditionally published and self-published, and is also a German translator who works with authors who want to get their books translated into German. And we have a wonderful conversation, but before I get into that conversation with Annette, I'm going to lead with a word from our sponsor, as well as talk about some comments from recent episodes. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is an awesome way for you to get your audiobooks out into the global audiobook market. And I'm not just talking about the big players like Audible, like Apple Books, like Kobo, or even Google Play. I'm talking about, additionally, multiple library systems such as Overdrive, as well as half a dozen other library systems around the world, as well as retail locations that are popular with audiobooks that you might never have heard of, and they're all available through Findaway Voices. You can find narrators through Findaway Voices in order to produce your books, or if you already have the audio files ready to go, you can use Findaway Voices to distribute them into that global marketplace. And one of the benefits of Findaway Voices, one of the many benefits of Findaway Voices, is you can control the retail price on 95% of the sites out there. There are sites, for example, such as Audible, that will set their own prices, but you can set the retail price everywhere else, which means Findaway Voices is going to be able to enable people to do price promotions on audiobooks, which previous to them coming around was not really available. And you can find out more about how you can use Findaway Voices as an author over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. The corporate sponsorship you just heard about pays for the hosting fees for this podcast, but it's the patrons supporting this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections that pay for my time in producing the show. And a special thank you and shout out to all patrons of the podcast and a reminder that with the current random draw for a print copy of Patrick O'Donnell's books, Cops and Writers, patrons automatically get entered into an additional draw just for being patrons. You see, it's the interaction and the comments and the patrons that truly fuel me in producing this podcast. So thanks to the patrons and to all those who have commented and emailed me about the show. I appreciate you taking the time to let me know what resonates with you. Recent comments on episode 84 include Amy Tasukata, who says, Hope you enjoy your standing desk. Don't take it too far all at once. The first day I stood up all day and ended up really hurting my sciatic nerve. Thanks, Amy. As I am recording this, which is a Thursday evening, Liz is in the garage putting the finishing touches on the front of my stand-up desk, uh, which the front of the desk is actually going to be a custom set of bookshelves because she's building the whole thing herself. Uh, it's looking pretty awesome so far, and, and yes, in case anyone's wondering, I am helping Liz by occasionally going out and holding things while she cuts or drills. You see, she's the one who is amazing with tools and woodworking and construction and that's just cool with me. As mentioned previously, once the new office and the new stand-up desk are done, I'll be sharing pictures on the show notes at starkreflections.ca. I should be moved back into my newly renovated office next week. This week, we finished putting the new faux hardwood floor in, and by we, I mean Liz did it, and I occasionally helped, as well as reorganized the layout of the room and the bookshelves, including um, the storage in the closet, which is fantastic. I'm really excited about 
what we did together uh, improving that space. It's going to be a lot more efficient for me. Now, Amy also says in her comment that she writes a crime series dealing with a Yakuza, so it was fun for her to hear Patrick talk about the other side of crime. Chad Boyer asked a question about the difference between sheriffs and cops, which Patrick answered, and I'll give you a hint. One of the differences is that a sheriff is an elected position. But, of course, there's more information over in Patrick's comment. MZ Lowe, who writes Epic Fantasy, says... If you got to create a fictional universe world, what three questions would you ask to shape the various police functions for different nations in that world? And Vale Nagel says, I always forget to leave a comment because I'm alternating the new episodes with the old ones until I catch up. <laughs> I hear you, sir. I'm the same way on several of the podcasts I listen to. I often have to binge uh, to get through a batch of them when I fall behind. And I usually try to do that on a long walk, a run. Or maybe when I'm doing some chores around the house, like washing the dishes or folding the laundry. Now, Vale asked a similar question to the one that uh, MZ Lowe asked. And Patrick answered both questions, suggesting modeling it after the same rank, structure, specialty units, etc. as a local police force. That way the story can have some consistency in that new world. Now, you can, of course, read the full comments and Patrick's answers over at starkreflections.ca for episode 84, or go ahead and leave your own comment or ask Patrick a question. You've got until the end of the month for that. So far, uh, one of these four, Amy, Chad, MZ, or Vale, will win a print copy of Patrick's book. You can throw your name into the hat for that draw, too, just by asking a question or leaving a comment on that episode before July 31st, 2019. See, Vale, I'm making it easier for those Batch listeners to still get a chance to win, even though they may be coming to the episode after the week it first came out. In any case, that's it for the introductory matter for this episode. Let's get right into this interview with Annette. Hi, Annette. Thanks for joining me here today. Hi, Mark. Glad to be here. <laughs> so... Uh, the first question I want to ask is, how long have you been doing uh, translations of, of novels? Uh, of novels, I've only started last year. Um, when I entered the, the book scene um, with the publication of my first book, I also started translating. But I've been uh, a translator since, I think, 1995. Um, and I was in the legal business before that. Okay. Were you translating legal documents? Originally? Yeah, contracts, that sort of thing. And uh, translating books is so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the what's the main difference that you found uh, since you did you know other types of documents or legal documents? Um, in in legal documents, you don't have a, a natural lingual flow. Um, they're not supposed to sound good. They're supposed to confuse you. So it's really, really tricky to uh, to translate it and to get all the nuances right. And um, of course, you have to you have to get emotion and um, you know tension and all of that into uh, into the literature translation. But it's it's more natural, so it's okay. it's a lot easier to do for me. <laughs> okay, and uh, is it okay if we go a little bit into uh, your own uh, writing? Um, yeah, we can do that. Okay. So what what is it that you write? I know we're here to talk about translations, but I'm curious to know more about what you actually have written. Well, I started out in the contemporary romans section, um, published my first, self-published my first books in, in 2016. And um, then it sort of happened that I wrote a children's adventure for my sons, and, and I wrote that in German. Uh, the first okay. books were in English, and um, I found a publisher for that. So that's just, this is really rocking. It's really taking off, and um, really, it's really great. I've published three books by now, and uh, two more written, and that wow. will be published next year. And um, now I've also written a con uh, historical romance that I, it just wouldn't leave me alone. I had to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> now you were writing uh, romance in uh, in English. Yes. Okay. And how were you? So you're you're in Germany. Yes. Uh, how were you publishing? Were you going to Amazon KDP or how were you getting the book? Uh, um, I started. I made a few mistakes, uh, beginners' mistakes. I started out with a 
a print on demand company in Germany. Okay. Um, trusted them completely to to distribute the books in in America and everywhere. And then I found out that um, they charged almost fifty dollars for the print book in the states. Oh, I wow. was like, what? Wow. Um, of course, nobody bought it. I, I wouldn't have. And um, right. so I uh, I took my books off that platform and then I started on Amazon. And uh, my problem is that I haven't done any marketing to, to be serious about. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really selling my English books, but the German books um, are very well taken care of. And now I'm focusing on that. I'm currently translating the English books into German to publish in German, and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Now, just for for you know, a North American uh, audience, you you talked about print on demand uh, as the thing. Um, the German book market is really huge, and it's mostly print. I mean, eBooks are probably not as much of the industry as they are. Uh, the print books are probably huge in Germany. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's 46% uh, of all book sales are print books. So the local bookstores are really the place to be if you want to sell books. And ebooks only make about 5% of overall sales. It's really amazing, but it is increasing. So that, that there's a market there that's expanding. Yeah, and, and, and I do know, I mean, having been to the Frankfurt Book Fair, I know just how gigantic the... <laughs> It's the, awesome. I was the there German last year for the first time, and, and I was just flashed. It was <laughs> immense. <laughs> I never expected it to be that big. Okay. So the difference, uh, because you started off with uh, independent publishing, um, and then and obviously you found the, someone who was wrong to work with, which is very common, right? Lots mm -hmm. of, There's lots of players in the industry who sort of take advantage of, uh, of writers in, in different ways, you know, uh, where you don't know, oh, here's what they do with your book in, in North America. This is how much they're charging. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between, you know, doing it yourself and then how did you find the publisher for, for the children's book? Was it a picture book illustrated? Or like um, no, it's, an, it's a Christian adventure book, um, age group around 8 to 12 years old. And um, okay. that was through personal contact actually my husband secured that deal for me because he met the publisher at a conference and really told them about my book <laughs> and they said well send it over and uh, i sent it and one week later um she called me and, and told me those historic words um i read your book and i couldn't put it down whoa That's <laughs> i was scary. like I, I still can't believe that happened you know <laughs> Oh, wow. And those are written in German, right? Those are and, written in German, yes. Um, and so those books are available I, through bookstores, et cetera? And, and they German. are in bookstores uh, all over the place, and um, they're doing all the marketing for me, and um, I'm getting invited for readings and stuff, and it's it's really amazing. It's, it's a big difference if you have a, a really good publisher behind you who will who will push your work, and they're really pushing. I mean, I'm... I'm still stunned at how much they do. I've yeah, heard other sure. people with, with publishers who uh, who didn't do anything, and I was really lucky in that regard. Oh, and so you say there's three books out in that in that series already? Yeah, there are three books in the series, and two more will be published next year. Wow, that's exciting. So you've got this uh, traditionally published uh, children's book deal that's going really, really well. Yeah. And now you've got uh, romance novels written in English, but now you're translating them to German. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and you're doing that because that's one of your specialties is, is translation. Um, yeah, uh, because with the success that's coming in, in the German market, I'm thinking, you know, I should move in there. I should focus on that. And um, if, it, if everything works out well, then I'm going to translate all the other books back into English. <laughs> <laughs> Although perfect. I have a German now, but, but I still have to wait for that. Uh, oh, I can imagine that uh, the competition for independently published romance books in, in German are, is probably not going to be as saturated uh, as it might be in, in, in the U.S. I think so, right. because a lot of, of the books on the market in Germany are translations. Really? Um, There's I, not a lot of uh, like native German romance? Um, there are, but there's a question of quality. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. All right. So that's that. That I, so you're you're a pioneer then uh, in in that regard, in in a very large book market. Um, I don't know if I'm really a pioneer. I mean, there are a lot of good books out there, and especially in the self-publishing area, there there are people pushing into that, and um, it's. I think it's expanding, and quality is on the rise. Uh, with so much, so many authors um, really doing a very, very good job. So, um. okay. Well, let's get into translation. So, a lot of authors who are doing well in English, for example, are saying, "Hey, okay, so Germany is a huge book market." And obviously, in Tolino, can we just talk for a second about? Uh, since we're on the German book market. So you've got Amazon as a huge player, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then Tolino is one that I'm familiar with because I used to work for Kobo and I know they're now part of the Kobo organization, but they're an amalgamation of a giant conglomerate of independent bookstores and chain bookstores and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. How, how prevalent is that to somebody in Germany? Like is Tolino a brand that is known and recognized the way Amazon is known? Um, it is definitely known because they are handing out those devices so you can read ebooks on. And um, in, in the various Facebook groups, you you will see people, oh, I've got this on my Tolino and do you have this deal? And, you know, it's, it's definitely talked about. Um, so, yes, there's, uh, it is, uh, I'm lost here. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> so, but but Tolino is a brand that's recognized. It's not like this little piddly little company that nobody. Because again, it, w from coming from a North American perspective, you know, there's Amazon, there's Google, there's Apple, there's Kobo, there's Nook. Those are the big players in the ebook market. But I, I'm not sure people recognize. I think yeah, Tolino and Kindle are those the two brands that are most familiar. Okay, cool. And and as an independent author in Germany, there's a way to get into Tolino directly, or how do you get your books into into that market? Um, we, I said a, a moment ago that I use this print on demand store, and um, right. they do this these jobs. They they get the book into um, into all the the relevant bookstores. And also on on ebook stores, so um, it's not really a bad deal what they offer. Just as long as you stay within Germany. So I'm actually thinking about working with them again as as soon as I get my books translated. Um, the thing is that if you go abroad, then then you have a problem. But staying inside the German market, um, they they offer a good service. So they oh really they will do they actually get, uh, charge you to, to get into uh, places like Tolino or how does that work? Yeah, you pay a charge. They um, I think um, it's a royalty agreement. You get about for ebooks, you get about seventy percent royalties, and they okay. keep the rest. Okay, but that's all that that's all that they charge. Mm -hmm. that's okay, so you so you can publish for free, and when you make money is when they keep. 30% yes. and give you 70. So the same thing as KDP or I think you, you, you pay an initial fee of about 20 euros, but that's nothing. That's, <laughs> that's okay. okay. What about using, uh, I know for example, draft to digital um, from the U S publishes into Tolino. Uh, I know even when I worked at Kobo, I couldn't get my books directly into Tolino through Kobo. I had to, I had to publish them through draft to digital what, it, for a, a, an author from Germany using an American company. How does that work? Um, I've, I've tried that. Um, I think I, I published my, one of my English books on uh, draft or digital now, and, um, I had, don't have any results yet, but it worked. Um, it's, it's no problem. Okay. There were, there weren't issues with taxes or anything weird coming. Oh, you I, have no, to I'm, fill I'm out, Canadian. You have to fill out all the forms and stuff. On, um, right. I don't really know what happens when I get the tax return. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find that out, I guess. I'll find that okay. out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving back into translation. So a lot of people are looking at getting uh, books translated. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask a silly question that I'm sure you hear all the time. Well, what can't, why can't I just use Google Translate to <laughs> translate my novel? Well, you can if you want to get a lot of one-star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, you're, you're almost guaranteed a one-star review with that, right? <laughs> um, the problem is, I, I, I'm actually I'm amazed at how uh, 
how intelligent those translation engines are by now. Um, they really do a lot of things right, but there are some huge stumbling blocks um, in the German language that will just kill your manuscript completely. And uh, one of those is um, the form of address. Because uh, while you in, in English, you ha only have you. Uh, in German, we have two different ways of addressing people. Uh, you have a formal address and you have a, a familiar address. So if you talk to your friends, you will say do. And if you talk to your to your boss or someone, um, you will say Z. And that's a whole completely different form of grammar used. And um, Google Translate is is going to screw it up completely. <laughs> okay. So would that be similar to uh, in French? You would say instead of to for for you, it would be vous, which is a lot more formal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same okay, thing. So if you if you translate into French, uh, you will have the same problem. I think other languages, European languages, have that. Okay, um, that's interesting. Now, uh, now you've worked with what genres do you work uh, with when you're translating? When like the novel translation, because you started that about a year ago, right? Yeah, I started that about a year ago. I um. I translate thrillers. I'm currently translating historical novels uh, set in the Second World War. Um, I've also done one thriller bordering on horror. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Was it just too dark or too disturbing for you? <laughs> it's just too creepy. I'm, I'm very sensitive, so I don't do horror and I don't do erotica. <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's just out of my realm. But, um, Apart from that, I, I have no restrictions as to what I translate. Okay. Um, and you do and you do nonfiction as well. Uh, not happily. If I had okay. a choice between fiction and nonfiction, I would definitely choose fiction because stick, stick with fiction. Okay, so authors looking for for services are probably not horror authors. No, <laughs> not erotic <laughs> authors. But uh, so, so I'm not going to have any luck hiring you to, to do any of my horror novels. Mm -hmm. So okay. sorry. No. So what, what what sort of research is involved uh, as part of the translation process? Well, especially with historical novels, you have to um, check for the right phrases. Um, for example, you, if you have uh, Second World War, the ranks of the Nazis were completely different to the ranks that we have in, in the Bundeswehr right now. So um, you have to research that. And um, there are also, there are things um, that exist in the States, if it's a, a story set in the States, Things exist in the States that don't exist in Germany. Um, I've had this in, in a college context where there was just an abbreviation and it was a, a RA. And I was like, no, AR, RA. Um, I thought, what the heck is that? You know? <laughs> so I had to research that and I found it's an, a resident advisor. And I thought, oh, okay, so what does that person do? Um, because you don't have that in Germany. You know, and then oh, so it's not just taking our and translating. It's like, well, first of all, I need to know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Because if I don't understand it, the reader won't understand it. You know, um, so I have to make it make it into something the reader can hold on to. Okay. So how does that work? I mean, is that where you you go back to the author and 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 just say, well, what's the context here? I don't understand. Or or do they provide a glossary of of, of certain like local terms maybe? Um, usually my first step is to go back to the author and ask um, if he or she is for some reason not available. I will um, I will just research. I found out about Uber is. <laughs> oh, there's no Uber there uh, in Germany. No, I had no okay. idea what that is. I still don't know exactly what it is, but I <laughs> 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 it's not a taxi, but something like that. <laughs> So it, 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 it's, it's crowdsourced taxi, basically. Anyone with a car can sign up to, to it's ride sharing, sort of, but then they, they get paid. And so some people, it's their full time. The, the way indie authors can now self publish their works. <laughs> if someone with a, with a car can, can, can become a taxi cab, mm -hmm. uh, basically, on, on demand. So that's what it is. Um, um, yeah, I mean, the last, the last few times I've been in, in Frankfurt, it was either uh, public transit or, or taxis or, or walking mm -hmm. to where I needed yeah. to go. Yeah, people so. actually walk over here. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. Uh, although, ironically, it was kind of funny. My walk to the hotel when I got to Frankfurt Book Fair 
was not as long as the walk within Frankfurt Book Fair. That's just how big it is to get yeah. from building to building. To building. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Uh, sorry, I digress. <laughs> so when you so you when you're working with an author, um, I've heard that it's important to use the same translator for all books in a series. You know, why would that be? Um, it is important because every author has his or her style, and so does every translator. So if you have uh, books in the series translated by different persons, the style will be a little bit off. And uh, readers will notice that and they will be annoyed. So, um, okay, so the voice itself is, is obviously not, it's not just the story, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, um, it's always a, a matter of style, a matter of how uh, do I formulate things? How, which words do I choose? Um, which expressions are my favorites? And, um, so that there can be really big differences between authors. I know, I know the author who translated the Outlander series by Diana Gabaldon. And mm. I, I think she started in on book three with the translations and then they asked her to retranslate the first two books that she hadn't done before just to get them all in the same um in the same style and oh that's interesting uh, yeah. how that would work yeah i guess because uh well i guess with audiobooks for example sometimes you uh, i mean i listen to michael Connolly and um titus Weaver is an actor who plays him uh, on bosch on the amazon uh prime uh sort of online uh, streaming series and ever since I heard him do a Bosch novel, he's been doing them since that point in time. But it would be interesting to see if they if they might go back and re-record them, um, just because he's become the voice of Bosch in, in, in many ways, which is his main character. Interesting how that. Yeah, I guess that would make a lot of sense. So, how does a translator uh, get work? Is it through some sort of agency or is it just directly on your website or word of mouth? What, what's the, what's the most common way that, that authors get in contact with you? Um, well, for me so far, it's been word of mouth. Mostly I have a lot of contacts in, in various uh, Facebook groups. And, and I, when I started out translating, I, I just spread the word and said, Hey, if, if you want to go into the German book market, uh, give me a buzz. And um, I've been busy nonstop ever since, and I'm really amazed because I don't do any advertisement. <laughs> so it's really, oh, really word of mouth has been so far. And I get I have my uh, my websites um, where I'm advertising that. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm I'm just waiting <laughs> what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the typical what is the typical uh, cost involved? Um, for, for translating, let's say it's a, a hundred thousand word novel. Um, let's say it's in the romance genre. Um, well, I'm charging three cents per word. Okay. So, uh, which is by German standards, inexplicably cheap. Um, be, really? Okay. Uh, German translator prices are just, I don't know. They're just uh, shooting through the roof. <laughs> Um, publishers okay. will pay more than 10 euros per page, per standard page, was about 250 words. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. And, and I'm well aware that no self-published author will ever be able to pay that kind of money. So no. I'm, I'm kind of keeping my head low and <laughs> offering cheaper <laughs> prices on the international market and um, just working for, for indies because I like to support indie authors. Okay. Um, yeah. So now, is that three American cents or is that three euro? That's or, or, three euro cents. So three euro cents. Okay. I'm, I really don't know how much that will be. It's okay. It's hard to do the translations. In Canada, for example, that would probably be closer to five and a half cents Canadian or six cents um, Canadian. So it's probably a stronger, the American dollar is stronger. So we, we, can, we can do the math somehow, mm -hmm. figure that out. That actually is a reasonable rate. Very, very reasonable. How can, you afford, <laughs> how can you afford that? I guess because you also have books that you publish. Yeah, um, I think one of my best assets is that I type really, really fast. Okay. All right. So um, I got about 2,000 words translated in one to one and a half hours. Um, okay. I think that's a pretty good rate. So. Um, where other people might take a lot longer and those have 
more time they spend on a translation. So I, I'm pretty fast. So, so how does that work then? So uh, an American author, for example, says, okay, I've got this thriller. I want to get it translated uh, in, into German mm -hmm. and, and, and you do, you know, the sample and then they go, okay, great. Looks good to me. <laughs> I have no idea. It's how do they know the voice and, and all those things? What are, what are some tricks? Um, you would, it would definitely help if you knew someone who spoke German and you could give it to them and say, here, read this. Is it any good? Because of okay. course you won't be able to evaluate it. Um, that's, that's definitely a help. And, um, I wouldn't know how else you would do it if, except trust. <laughs> Trust, trusting someone or, or knowing someone who, uh, who reads the language to go, okay, this is, are there, are there services out there? Are there, are there reading services or uh, review? Uh, yeah, places? there are services. You can get a proofreader to, to check the manuscript, um, which is probably a smart thing to do. Um, and, but it's also an additional cost. So, and of course I, I set up a contract um with right. every with every uh author i work with um ensuring that i'm not going to change the manuscript that i'm not going to add any <laughs> additional characters oh. into the story oh. and stuff like that <laughs> a subplot that you really just wanted to get in there yes <laughs> i'm not going to erase anyone kill anyone off or so <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so uh, <laughs> it's like it was hugely successful because i actually changed the ending it was a better ending <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. So, but speaking of contracts, what are what are some of the legal aspects um, of translations in Germany? Um, well, in Germany, the copyrights are a bit different because the translation is regarded as much a creative work as writing a book itself. So the translator will keep the copyrights and he will pass the, the, the publishing rights on to the author, but the author is not allowed to change the translation without the translator's consent. So that's one important aspect. And um, another thing about selling books in, in Germany is a, a fixed price. Um, okay. it's, it's a law that you're not allowed to sell a book on different platforms for different prices. And that's print books or is that print books and eBooks? Um, that's print books. I'm not sure about eBooks. They are a bit different, but um, the fixed price rule definitely goes for um, for print books. So if you, for example, have them on on Talia and Amazon and you want to run an Amazon countdown deal, um, you will have to adjust the prices on Talia as well, because otherwise okay. you'll break the law. <laughs> and, and that's one of the reasons. So in markets like France and Germany, for example, that's one of the reasons why the independent bookstores have not been completely demolished and, and killed by an Amazon or a Walmart or some major retailer that can just come in and mm -hmm. slash prices and then watch everyone else die. Um, I think that's one of the reasons. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very protected market. I think they have, they have very solid rules in place to, to keep everything running and it's running very smoothly. I mean, I can go to a bookstore here in, in my town and tell them, well, I want this book. They don't have it on store. They'll have it by the day or next day or the day after. It's just okay. going to be there. So it's really amazing how that how everything works. And there are there are, there there are a large number of of publishers in in Germany as well, right? There's there's like yeah. the, the big ones, the small ones. The, there's all kinds of different presses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, everything. <laughs> <laughs> so what has uh, I've heard that the, the German uh, book market is, has been on the rise again for the first time since 2012. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, they, they had a big decline, which I'm not quite sure why, why it happened, because Germany is a country of readers, most definitely. Um, right. But uh, I think there was a bit of confusion with all the, the new books coming up and self-publishing and everything. And it just got really confused and people didn't know uh, where to get books, how, how to learn about new releases and stuff like that. So all the publishers and bookstores, they got together and, and developed a plan how to uh, reverse this, this development. And they actually succeeded. They, they have a lot more social media presence now to, to show up new releases. And um, they're doing events much more than they did in the past, 
you know, bookstores do readings. Um, here in our town, a new bookstore opened up and, and they're just hugely successful with all the stuff they're doing, inviting authors and, and doing all sorts of events. And that's really pulled it around, I think. Oh, that's amazing. Sounds like it's a really great time to be either a reader or a writer in Germany. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what what popular what are the most popular genres so when you walk into a bookstore are there certain types of things that are that are featured over others when you, like physically in a bookstore and then and I'm curious then about online as well um well Germans love their thrillers so if you're a thriller author you definitely want to get into the German market because they okay. read thrillers like crazy <laughs> okay top genre uh, second place is romance and okay. um, after that, it's it's I think distributed fairly evenly between different genres. Fantasy, the the, the children's book market is really huge, but the quality uh, standard is also very high. And no matter whether you have picture books or um, children's stories, adventures, stuff like that. So okay. that's um, that's that's a big field. And are there? Um... Are there issues with people in Germany reading books set in North America or 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 anywhere else? Like that's a, that's okay. There's no big deal. Um, I think they like it actually. If books are not set in Germany, there are not many books set in Germany. So even German writers will set their books in in England or the States or wherever. Right. Um, but there are local authors coming up now in the self-publishing uh, section who say, well, this is the area I live in. I'm going to stage my thriller here. And so that it's, it's a new development that's um, also successful because there are readers who say, well, I'd like to read books set in, in Germany, you know, in, in, the th in the area I know. So it's, that's nice. I've read one recently that was set around here where I live, and I thought, oh, look, I've even worked in the hotel they mentioned. It. <laughs> oh, that's that's always fun, right, when you find yeah. something that has some local flavor to it as well. Yeah, so, yeah, that's that's really cool. Cool. Now, uh, for, for the translations that you do, you... you do you prefer thrillers, romance? What do you What do you enjoy? Because you write romance, so is is romance easier for you? Because you naturally, that's just something that you already write. Um, no, I can't say that. I'm I'm a sucker for a good story. So I don't okay. care what genre it is. If it's a good story, I love it. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just as long as it's not too gory or, or bloody. Yeah, or, not too okay. gory and, and not too much sex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, what is something uh, that you would love for people more interested in learning about the German book market? What is something that you think would be important for them to know or understand? Mm. Uh, whew, I don't really know. It's... Um, I think it's probably difficult for for someone who doesn't speak the language to to go into a market um, where you don't know how all the the publishing works, how the marketing works, how to reach people. So you would really need to get support from from you know not only translators but also from marketers. Okay. Are there marketing uh, outfits or services that you're aware of in, in Germany? That, well, that, you know, like yeah, there are several. Um, I haven't tried them, so I don't know how, how good they are, if, if what they promise is actually working. <laughs> okay. but, <laughs> but there are a number of services who will uh, also have, try to help in the authors. Um, so you would have, a, have to take a look around. There's There's one... A site I came across it's called indiesgogerman.com and um, there's a lot of valuable information on that site so if you're really seriously interested in, in entering the book market in Germany you you have to visit that site they have uh, video tutorials about the, the various things publishing processes about the fixed price rule about copyrights all of that is explained on that site so no, that's great. Thank you. Um, now, the other last thing about the German book market is, uh, so print books are still very strong mm -hmm. in Germany. Uh, Ebooks are continuing to grow. How is the audiobook market uh, for like German? Are there German audiobooks? 
I really don't know um, because I haven't looked into that at all. I know that there, in the in the children's book area, there are a lot of parents who will buy endless books, uh, audiobooks for kids because uh, children love to listen to things while falling asleep. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> like being read to, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's like being read to, and um, so so that's definitely a market. But apart from that, I know that there are a lot of people who uh, listen to books while driving, you know, commuting to work or stuff. So, but how strong that market is, I really don't know. Okay, great, cool. So, and then the very final question is, so people who are interested in learning more about you, maybe checking out your children's books if they, if they read in German or checking out some of your romance or novels or your translation services. How are the best ways for people to find out more about you? Well, I do have, uh, actually I have three websites, which is a bit too much, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you uh, the English one. It's, it's called chatwithanet.wordpress.com. And um, you can link to all the other sites and, you know, get all the information from there. Contact me. Um, you can also find me on Facebook as uh, author Annette Spratte. And um, yeah, so looking forward to hearing from you. <laughs> Excellent. And, and and even though I've tried, I'm probably not going to be able to properly pronounce your uh, your name in the, with the German proper inflection and tone. And no, uh, probably not, but I'm used to that. I li I've lived in the States for a while and I react both to Annette and Annette. <laughs> 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 Whatever Excellent. language I'm currently in. <laughs> well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. I was thinking about what Annette said about the subtle nuances in language and terms. She spoke about the differences of the formal and the familiar, or of a term that's actually not known. She said, for example, reading the term Uber in Germany meant nothing to her. She came to realize, after speaking with the author, that it was a kind of crowdsourced taxi service. But again, it's a term that means something in certain countries, but might not exist or have any meaning in another. There's a really cute video I recently saw from Help Helen Smash TV. Now, uh, this is the persona of the hilarious Laura Clary. She has 5.1 million Facebook followers for this page. And in this particular video, she riffs on the, the different terms uh, with her husband that uh, English parents versus American parents use, such as stroller versus pram, uh, flannel versus shirt or washcloth. A diaper versus nappy, lift versus elevator, truck versus lorry. Or in the UK, for example, it's called sweets. In the US, it's a candy bar. And in Canada, it's a chocolate bar. All usually referring to the same thing. The same delicious sweet treat. Speaking of chocolate bars, in Canada, we have something called Smarties, which are kind of an M&M style candy. So it's candy coated chocolate pieces. But in the U.S., the brand of Smarties are these little pressed powder pellets, almost like a fez, but they're, but they're round and they're rolled uh, into a tube, like a transparent plastic a tube shape that you can unroll from either end, almost like, a, um, almost like just a hard candy. Uh, now in Canada, those same things in that roll are called rockets. But also in Canada, we have Coffee Crisp, which is a chocolate bar or sweet or candy bar. <laughs> but you can't get Coffee Crisp brand in the U.S. Now, these elements can be mistakes in the pieces that we write. For example, with me growing up in Canada, here in Ontario, I might be writing about a fellow who lives in Los Angeles who decides to go to the corner store, or is it called the local deli, and, and pick up a bag of Dill pickle flavored potato chips. Of course, I have friends in LA, and I know that in California specifically, and in most states, except maybe for the some of the eastern states and maybe some of the ones that are closer to Canada, you can't get dill pickle flavored potato chips. And in many states, you can't even get ketchup flavored potato chips, but that's something that we grew up with here in Canada. Now, those elements can also be something that helps bring some relevance or local flavor to a fictional society in your writing. Maybe it's just a time period. For example, in, in Canada, at least in Ontario here, stubby beer bottles might be indicative 
of a story set in the 60s or 70s or early 80s. Um, speaking of which, the drinking age is also different. So in Ontario, Canada, the drinking age is 19. In many U.S. states, including several that border us uh, here in Ontario, it's 21. So for accuracy, it never hurts to have a beta reader or an early reader who's maybe familiar with uh, the customs, the terminology, and the availability of things in your story if it's set in a different country or a different locale or province, or state than the one that you are intimately familiar with. Of course, you can always reach out to friends via Facebook or Twitter or other social media and get an answer pretty quickly if you're not sure about different terminology. Simple as saying, hey, we call it pop here in Ontario. What do you call a soft drink in Missouri? Is it soda? Is it pop? Is it soda pop? What's the term that you use? In some cases, they use a generic thing like Coke to mean any soda or pop, depending on where you're from. But I think you get the point. And you can also use these elements in your fiction to create additional subtle layers of reality that give it an extra feel, an extra flavor, extra character that helps bring the reader right into the story and understand the time, the era, the location, the local customs. So paying attention to those little things that may be setting pieces in your fiction can create problems, but they can also be used to create something that adds extra depth, extra layers. I hope you enjoyed that reflection. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful interview with Annette. Thanks for hanging out with me here in episode 85 of the Stark Reflections podcast. Again, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Looking forward to catching up with you again next week in episode 86. And until then, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.